Lesson 9.2, page 490, Solve Quadratic Equations by Graphing. In this lesson, you will learn how to solve a quadratic equation by graphing, how to use a graph to find and approximate the zeros of a function, and how to solve real-life problems using graphs of quadratic functions. A quadratic function is a nonlinear equation that can be written in standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Now, we learned a great deal about what you see highlighted here. We learned how to solve quadratics in standard form in chapter seven by factoring, and we learned how to graph standard form quadratics in the first three lessons of chapter eight. So, what I highlighted here is really just a review of what you learned in Chapter 7, much of 8. In Chapter 7, as I just said, you learned how to solve a quadratic by factoring. You are going to learn in this lesson how you can solve a quadratic of this form by graphing. Now, to solve by graphing, it's three easy steps. First of all, make sure you write the equation in standard form equal to zero then graph the related function. Now, you can use your calculator to graph this. No work required. And you don't hear me say that very often, that I'm not requiring work. This is simple. You put it in your calculator, and you use your calculator to graph it. And this will help you find, in step three, the x-intercepts. Now, you might have to look at your graph and table to get the x-intercepts. And the solutions, or the roots of the problem, are the x-intercepts of the graph. So if you know the x-intercepts, you found the answer to the problem. It's probably a lot easier for me to show you that process. So let's go to this first example and work through it together. So in order to solve this by graphing, the first step, we have to make sure that we write the equation in standard form. So I'm going to make ev get everything on one side, zero on the other. So I'm going to take away three from the right and the left. And now you see a standard form equation equal to zero. Now remember, one little reminder, standard form, do you see how it's second degree? Second degree equations we would expect to get two answers for, okay? So now what I'm going to do is take my calculator out and put this equation in my calculator. So that's just hit the y equals key and type in x squared plus 2x minus 3. Now go ahead and hit graph and see your graph. And now what I want to do real quick is just point out, do you notice, I'm going to take a highlighter, it looks like my graph intersects the x-axis at negative 3, and it looks like it intersects the x-axis at 1. So right now I think my answers are negative 3 and 1. Let's make a table and just verify that. So if I just go ahead and make a table, Let's verify that. It looks okay. Well, first of all, 1 is definitely an answer because you see how when x is 1, y is 0. And negative 3 is definitely an answer because negative 3 gives me 0. So my answers are negative 3 and 1. That's how you can use your calculator to solve, using graphing, a standard form quadratic. Really easy to do. What I would like you to do real quick now is pause the video. Why don't you try 1, 2, and 3. Solve these by graphing them on your calculator. Uh, check them when you're done. And I'm back. You should have gotten these responses. And again, you can always check. Like in question 3, if I want to check to see if 3 is an answer, plug a 3 in here and plug a 3 in here and see if 3 squared plus 3 would equal 12. It does. Okay? So if you are not getting these, make sure when you come to class you ask and we can show how we got these on our calculator. Remember, the first step's really important. Always make sure you have everything on one side, zero on the other, before you plug this in. Do you notice these two? You have to rewrite those to make that happen. Now, when you solve quadratics, it's possible to only get one solution or none, even though it's second degree. Remember, second degree means we expect two answers. So let's look at these and see why this problem is only giving you one solution. So the first step to solving that is we have to rewrite it in standard form. 
So I'm going to add 16 to both sides, which gets me this equation. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and plug that in, go to my calculator, do that. So you can see I typed this in my calculator. Now I'm going to graph it. And you notice on my graph, it looks like my graph is only touching the x-axis in one place. It looks like it's only touching at x equals 4. Okay, let me check that. Let's go to a table and check it. I'm going and seeing, does 4 produce 0? And yeah, 4 produces 0, and it looks like that's my only solution. So x is 4, just like it has it in the book. And you can see here, they said x is 4. There's just one solution to that problem. The parabola only touches in one place. Okay, let's go to the second example. It's possible that even though it's second degree, you might get no solution. Let's see how could that happen. Well, you notice here, I don't have everything on one side, zero on the other. So the book, they decided to add x squared to each side. So now I have 0 on the left, x squared plus 2x plus 4 on the right. Let's go ahead and put that in our calculator. And you can see that I have that plugged in. Now let me graph it. Do you notice how the graph is not touching the x-axis? The parabola opens up. It's not touching the x-axis anywhere. This problem then has no solutions to it. Okay, so again, no solutions. This, this graph did not touch the x-axis anywhere. What I would like you to do is why don't you try the even problems, number 4, 6, and 8. Pause the video, use your calculator to graph these. Now remember, when you graph these, you expect two solutions, but it's possible to only have one or none. And I'm back, and in number 4, we only get one solution, 6. In number 6, we only got one solution, it was negative 5. And in number 8, we got two solutions. They were negative 6 and negative 1. Now, I would put this in your notes. Remember, when you graph a quadratic or you solve them, you could get two solutions if you have two x-intercepts. You could get one solution if you only have one x-intercept. It's also possible to have no real solutions if you had no x-intercepts. And in the three examples I showed you, I went through each of those scenarios. Remember that when you are asked to find the zero of a function, you're looking for the x-intercept of the graph because remember, a zero of a function means what can you plug in for zero, what, I'm sorry, what can you plug in for x to make y zero? So in other words, what is x, what x value would, would give you 0 for y, okay, 0 for y. That's what you are looking for when they ask you to find the 0 of a function. So we could even find the 0 of a function for problems that are not quadratic. So let's, I tell you what, let's find the zeros of this function. Now this is not going to be a quadratic because if you double distribute it, you're going to get higher than second degree. Let's just plug this in the way we see it into our calculator. So I went ahead and plugged that function in for y. y equals the x minus 3 times the x squared minus x minus 2. Let me go ahead and make a graph of that. And now when we look at the graph carefully and we inspect it, we can find the zeros of that function. So it looks like negative 1 would be a response, 2 would be a response, and 3. So I think negative 1, 2, and 3. Let's check on my table. Let's see if that's true. So I need to make a table of this. So here's my table. Okay, negative 1 is definitely a solution. It's giving me 0. 2 is definitely a, a 0 of the function that gave me 0. Can you see? So is 3. 3 is giving you 0. So negative 1 and 2 and 3 are the zeros of the function. And that agrees with what they have here in the book. Negative 1, 2, and 3 were the zeros of the function. Now, when you find zeros of a function, unfortunately, they're not always going to be integers. That means whole amounts, okay? They're not always going to be whole amounts. So we might have to change the interval of our calculator table 
to estimate the zeros of the function. Okay? So let's look at this example, and this, this will help me r remind you, because you've done this before, you've changed your table before to tenths. We're going to find the zeros of the function that they have listed here. f of x equals x squared plus 4x plus 1. So to find the zero of the function, we want to know when this function equals zero. So let's go ahead and put that in our calculator. Okay, so you can see I plug the function in my calculator. Let me make a graph of it. Okay, so now you look at this graph carefully, and let me get my highlighter out. It looks to me like my answer is around negative 4 and close to 0, but I can't tell if it's exactly negative 4 and 0. So let's go to my table and check. All right, well... Negative 4, it can't, the answer is not negative 4 because negative 4 doesn't give me 0, but I want you to notice something here. Can you see how negative 4 gives me positive 1 and negative 3 gives me negative 2? 0 would be in between 1 and negative 2, so my answer has to be in between negative 4 and negative 3. Okay? Same thing down here. I said my other answer would be close to 0. You notice 0 doesn't give me 0. So Zero is not the answer. Negative one isn't the answer either. It's not giving me zero. But one and negative two, those two numbers, you've got to cross through zero to get to those. So my answer for this problem has to be in between zero and negative one. We are going to have to estimate these. So to do that, go to your calculator and you see I'm pointing at it, table set. Now, I said one answer is close to negative 4, so make sure your table is set to start at negative 4, and then this little symbol is your interval. I don't want the table going up one unit at, at a time. I want it going up a tenth at a time. Now, let's go back to our table, okay, and let's look here. I don't see 0 here, but you notice how point 24 is positive and negative point 11 is negative, so my answer to, to this problem has to be in between negative 3.8 and negative 3.7. Now, negative 0.11 is closer to 0 than 0.24, so one estimate to the answer would be negative 3.7, okay? And if you look in the book, you will see that that is one of the correct answers. One of the correct estimates is negative 3.7. Let's now get the other correct estimate, okay? Remember, my second answer I said was between 0 and negative 1. So go back to your table, and table set, let's start at negative 1. I know my other answer is between negative 1 and 0. So let's go back to table, and I'm looking for 0 here, and I'm not seeing it, but do you notice right here? Oops, got to get back to my calculator, hit a wrong button. Right here, I cross from negative 0.11 to positive 0.24. My answer is in between negative 0.3 and negative 0.2. Negative 0.11 is closer to zero, so my other estimate would be it's negative 0.3, and that also agrees with the book. And you can see that there, okay? Why don't you pause the video and try 10 and 11 using what we've just talked about here in the last minute or two of the video. And you're back, and here's 10, and here's 11. Again, if you didn't get those, make sure you ask. You can use this technique then to answer real-life problems. A football player kicks a football two feet above the ground with an initial vertical, vertical velocity of 75 feet per second. This function would represent the, the path of the ball, the height over time. So for part A, they want us to find the height of the football after each second it's kicked. Well, that's easy. Go ahead, take this equation. Put it in your calculator, so let's do that. You can see here I typed it in. Now go ahead, make a table. I'm going to have to fix my table from the last problem, so let's go back to table set, start it at zero, and let's change our interval back to one. 
Okay, now let me go back to my table. And you can see, after one second, the football would have been 65 feet in the air. After two seconds, it's 88 feet in the air. After three seconds, it's 83 feet in the air. After four seconds, it's 46 feet in the air. And so the ball must have landed on the ground between four and five seconds. In part B, they want me to estimate when the football was 50 feet in the air. So I can go back to my calculator. Um, it probably was 50 feet in the air at around close to four second mark and probably between zero and one seconds because that one second was 61 feet in the air. And then they asked to use the graph to find out when exactly was the football 50 feet above the ground. So in order to do that, I quickly have to, I want to know when H is 50. I've got to solve that problem. So remember, to put this in my calculator, I've got to get everything on one side, zero on the other. So I'm going to take away 50 from each side, and that would give me 0 equals negative 16 t squared plus 75 t plus uh, I'm sorry, minus 48, 2 minus 50 is negative 48. I got to put that in my calculator. Let me do it. And you can see I have that typed in. I'm going to make a graph. Now I can see on my graph as I'm looking at it that it looks like one answer is less than one and the other's little uh, one, two, three, a little bit less than four maybe. So I'm going to have to quickly go to my table set again. I know one answer is close to one. Let's change my tables to a tenth. So we've done that before. Okay, so I want to know um, where is this meeting zero. So it looks like eight tenths of a second would be the closest y value to zero. So one answer to the problem is when the football was kicked, about eight tenths of a second later, it was 50 feet in the air. And now my second answer, remember I said the other answer was between three and four. So I'm just changing my table to start at 3. Let's do that again. And I'm looking for 0 on here. It looks like my other answer, about 3.9 seconds in the air, the ball would have been 50 feet in the air as well. I'm going to pause the video here. If you have any questions, make sure you ask in class.